Do I have to be theatrical now? We are on the I, air. I start talking phony now because <laughs> now I, I get tense. Or can, can I just can I, can I go back to my to my easy easy self? Or should I get tense now? Get tense, Barry. Uh, all right, what's, all right, ready to act. Yeah, ready. What's that? I, have, I, I know I used to have a director. He was a wonderful guy, Herbert Berghoff. He's a famous actor and director. He used to say. He directed us in a play. He would walk by the theater and he would say, instead of saying, have the actors started the play yet? He'd say, have the actors started talking phone yet? <laughs> wasn't, was, was, Barry, isn't there that famous acting story of the dog that you, I think you told us this story or I heard it somewhere in the, the Uta Hagen books or something that the dog would know when the acting class was, go on, was going on because the, the people in the acting class would speak differently than yeah. when they weren't in the acting class. So the dog knew. Right, right. That's a, like a famous acting anecdote, right? Sure. You know, there's another story that Bobby DeVal, a very good actor, told uh, uh, Jack Walser, who's a wonderful acting teacher and a friend of mine. I told, uh, I think he told, uh, uh, yeah, he told Jack, he said, when we were working on The Godfather, um, uh, he noticed that Marlon talked to the people, you know, before the camera started, all the grips and and uh, the people on the camera, the makeup, in the exact same tone as when, he, as when, uh, as when they said action. He kept the same sense of reality going maybe he did that as a as a um a check on reality maybe he did that on purpose but he he talked in a way that he talked to people like like he talked to them it was just that same easy sense of conversation and uh, he didn't add anything on to it which you can do he can't do that maybe on the stage but you can uh well, even on the stage, you still have to memorize what it's like to, to talk to people, to talk to people, you know. I thought that was a very interesting story, of, uh, you know. One of the things you taught in the class, uh, this is Mike Messier with Barry Primus. This is uh, our second interview. If you haven't seen the first one, uh, you can watch this one first. You can watch the first one first. Whatever is your viewer's choice, but we appreciate you joining us and... Uh, but Barry, what I was going to say about Brando was, I think you showed us that scene in On the Waterfront where the actress had dropped the uh, woman's glove and Brando. That's true. Put... That's a true story. Yeah. Yeah. And that was not in the script, right? That was uh, spontaneous. Well, I don't know. I'm sure m m many of your people have seen the movie Waterfront. If they haven't, my God, they, they, it's a great American film. But Leah Kazam was the director who. I uh, worked with a few years in, in his company. And uh, uh, you'll notice that one of the great scenes of, uh, is between uh, Eva Marie Saint, uh, who plays his would-be girlfriend in Marlon, and they're talking and he's trying to, to find out about her and get involved with her. And while they're talking, she dropped her glove. And um, Kazan didn't stop, uh, you know, uh, shooting and Brando picks up the glove and he holds it and he puts his finger in the glove which is very sexual and perfect kind of thing and plays with it and she reaches for it and he pulls it back and they continue talking and if you'll see it it's just a very um, um, well spontaneous because it was spontaneous but it's just a very um, unique piece of behavior that kind of gives away the whole action of what Marlon's trying to do and what she's trying to do, you know, and how frightened she is of him. So yeah, it's a it's a, a wonderful bit of, uh, of of behavior that Kazan captured there that Brando did, you know. I think I, I think another aspect of it that you talked about in the class was. Uh that Brando, uh, by doing that, showed the vulnerability of this tough guy character, that although he was a tough guy character and, and kind of- A fighter, a boxer. Right, 
right and chose his words carefully that um he could still show a vulnerability to the woman maybe because he wanted to pick her up who knows but uh it was kind of a a thing that you wouldn't see with the machismo back then uh of a man putting on a woman's glove it was a it was uh provocative it was unusual it was it was exciting you know and, and kazan captured that on film with brando well i'm certainly i'm, I'm certainly uh, you know you don't know with a wonderful actor like that you don't know uh, uh how much is um it's not thinking on his part i'm sure it's, it's just total instinct that this goes with what i'm doing I think if it hadn't gone to what he what he was doing, he wouldn't he would have picked it up maybe, but not done that with it. It's um, you know when you have done work on the character and you're talented like that, and then you're in the moment. You have to do the work, and then in the moment things happen. You know, you found that as an act, haven't you? Then in the moment, you matter how much. You prepare, but in the moment, things happen, right? And you can go with them if they're right, if they're right, you know? Right. One of the most interesting acting experiences I've had, Barry, was uh, I was in a movie with a kid from Rhode Island School of Design right after 9-11, mm -hmm. and uh, the original 9-11, you know, 2001. And uh, he did kind of this movie that was based on two cousins. And one of them that I played was half Lebanese and half Caucasian and had a real identity crisis in the wake of 9-11. I mean, it wasn't even their country that was involved, but because the two cousins uh, had Middle Eastern background and the other yeah. cousin was full on Lebanese and was experiencing uh, racism uh, because of 9-11. That was some of the most intense acting I've ever been in, and my my scene partner, uh, my movie partner, was a was a student at uh, Brown who wasn't even an actor. He was just a real kid who happened to be Lebanese, and and he and I legitimately had some tension several times because I I felt like we got to go for the balls on this movie. We got to really push the envelope, and and because maybe he wasn't an actor, he was. Res more reserved but you know what happened is it it came out very well in the film the the film uh 20 minute student film one of the most exciting and intense projects i've ever been in um that this rhode island school of design student came up with and uh it had a provocative title i i call it the george odd show but his title was a little more uh, uh offensive uh sntv was the initials of it but um that was one of the most intense things, Barry. And my point is to, to, to jump on your point. We did have a, a outline, but we really didn't have a script. You know, most of the scenes were improv in a very uh, intense uh -huh. way, I thought. So, I mean, I, I hear you. I love writing scripts, you know, and my, my follow-up or my next question for you, Barry, was going to be, as someone who's done it all, writing, directing, acting, acting, coaching, um, yeah. What's some of the, I mean, this is a huge question and you can take it any way you want, but the relationship between, I would guess, uh, the screenwriter, the director and the actor, and maybe even the producer, those are four big elements. And all four of those, I would imagine, uh, can have different sense of responsibilities and ego and every project's going to be different. But can you kind of address that in a, in a way, uh, any way you want, you know, the, well, I mean, you know, the, everything starts with the idea, you know, right? the idea, which is either it's the producer gave it to the writer or the, you know, the writer gave it to the producer. And uh, ideally, um, ideally uh, they give it to a director who who understands the work, understands the writer, but you know, it's tricky because the writer, you know, he his his expertise, let's say, is is maybe the story and and the words and the dialogue. 
but that the director's job, their, his expertise is, is human behavior, is to create behavior out of those words. Not, you know, it's not enough that the actors say the words. The behavior has to make the words. Right. It's out of the behavior that the words happen. So hopefully the director with the understanding of the, uh, of the understands the writer and the writer and he talk and, and this and that. And then the producer, there's all kinds of producers. There are producers who just give you the money. There are producers who are creative, who have, have thoughts. Um, a lot of it has to do, and you know this, it has to do with who has the power, who has the money, who has the power. You know, when the movie's all over, the director in my position, if, unless it's his own movie like Mistress was, like mine, um, I'm working on a movie now where I don't have final cut. The final cut of the movie, you know, we, who, who, who will cut the movie. And then it's really dependent upon the producer, whether he, um, the director's guild gives you something like um, two cuts. You can make two cuts, well, that means you do one cut and then I give you notes and you do it another one. And if they're not, they don't like it, they can take it away from you. And then it's up to them to cut it. And that depends what your relationship is and what the producer thinks. So it's uh, Mike, you know, question of, you know, each situation being, you know, what it is, you know, I, I, in the project I'm working on, I'm trying to have a very good relationship this time with the creative, with the producers so that, so that they understand what I want to do and I understand maybe what they want so that we don't surprise each other. And then in the end, I know I can, I could mistreat them all I want because we're shooting and they can't do anything usually. But then when it's over, it's theirs. So I better, you know, I better know what I, I better, you know, you know, I, you hope that you have a good relation and you hope they understand you and hope they're creative and understanding, you know, unless you're Francis Coppola or something in which you have your own uh, direct, director's cut, you know. Barry, you just hit upon something about two minutes ago that I never heard before, but I, I'd love for you to expand on it because I'm not right now in the director's guild and, um, so yeah. my, my question would be... You don't need to be in the director's guild. If you're not, not making movies, I don't know what their story is, but uh, I don't know whether it would help you or hurt you to be in the director's guild, do you? I don't know. I mean, my, my question, just because I never heard that before, was that the director's guild actually gets involved with the creative process? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. When you, when you are done, when you're, when you're um, uh, done with the movie uh, in, a, in a commercial situation where you sign a, a uh, you, know, you have a, a contract, the director's guild looks over your contract and then you sign the contract, the producer, um, and you negotiate and you get like, usually two cuts of what the movie is. So you have a, and you have a, 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 a contract with the guild. The guild will, will ask, will, will uphold that for you. You know what I mean? They can't take it away from you and things like that. I think there's other things the guild does for you. Like when you're a guild director, you, you have to have a, I think it's a, an AD who's guild and a UPA who's guild and a unit uh, manager who's guild unit, I don't know what they're called, but they also make sure you get residuals when it plays. Right. They protect you. I don't think they allow a producer to take over the film and direct it. Uh, That's good. If they fire you, you get paid, you know, things like that. You know, they're a guild, they're a union, you know, and they protect you. Sure. Now they don't get involved creatively. No, they're not going to tell you no what to do. No, but they will fight for your rights. Yes. Well, that's good. Yeah. No, I, I guess I was I was uh, misunderstood. That's, that's what they do. Yeah. I was misunderstanding that. Well, okay. So, um, I guess for some of the audience out there, um, people that are familiar with my own work and people that are 
friends of mine that are making their own films. Um, one thing that I, I always caution my friends and myself is that, you know, on a limited budget uh, to even think about doing a film SAG after I, I always, I think that it's going to be three or four times the budget, at least whatever money you could make it non-union, you're going to end up spending three to four times that amount. If you go union. Well, you know, sometimes Mike, sometimes, um, you know, it pays sometimes if the budget is very small. It, it, it pays to think about being SAG because you might get better actors or actors who are more experienced. And so the guilds now are extremely liberal and want people to work with them. So there's just about any budget at all they'll accept. And then you know, I'm doing a movie now with my friends. We're doing a film. We're doing a feature that came from a short that I co-wrote, which I can send you as a matter of fact. And, but we co-wrote it. It became a feature. And now we have very little money, but we're going to do it. And um, But we have a lot of actors in it, maybe, wow, 40, 35, 40. But we are going to pay the SAG low, low budget. I think it's a hundred dollars or a little more a day. So if you're doing a short and you're shooting for four or five days, you have two actors in it or three actors in it. Um, it might pay you to, 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 th to think about it. You know, of course you have to then, you know, pay their insurance and this and that. So it's a little more, but the reason why people do it, uh, Mike, is because a larger range of actors, you know, that, that doesn't mean there aren't non, non union people who, who, who non SAG people with talent because there are. But, oh, well, and, yeah. and there are SAG actors, by the way, who will work for non SAG. I'm sure you've used SAG actors, right? Who didn't, didn't care. Well, well, you know what? The funny thing is, I haven't. I mean, the, the one time I used uh, someone who was SAG after was a great actress. And we went through the process of getting her a, uh, no, we paid her. We paid her and we paid the, the rest of the cast. It was a one day shoot, but we, we got a 20 minute short movie done in uh, one day and um, one day of principal shooting. And we had some exteriors that the uh, DP Tim Labonte had before. And that uh, short film won three awards, the impeccable. And uh, I feel good about it. So there's a lot of things out there that are uh, good. So, you want to do a 20, you really want to do a 20 minute movie in, tw in, in, in one day? That's we already, of, we already did. It's already done. That's a lot of work. Well, we, um, it was a lot of work, but we, did you we have had, long takes. Did you have long takes? Yeah, we had long takes, but here's the thing, Barry, you know, for, and not to uh, curtsy favor for you, but one of the things that I learned from your classes was the importance for me, at least, of rehearsal. No, that's, and that's we, I had the actors rehearsed. I think we rehearsed, I want to say, between four and six times via Skype. Uh, so the actors, one guy was in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Adam Lomframbrais, who's got a very interesting last name. Uh, Ashley Shea was in Boston. Uh, my actress, Naria Zakarian, who was Miss, Mrs. Europe, right. Uh, Mrs. Europe was on our movie and she was uh, in Massachusetts and we all did uh, and I would jump on there and, and we do a Skype rehearsal so nobody had to drive That's to fine. meet each other and, and uh, the thing that worked at Al Grayberry was that everyone had their lines memorized and well, uh, did, you meet, did you meet to shoot everybody together or not yeah, well we yeah we, we all got to it, we all filmed in one location in real life this was two years ago, so this is way okay, before. COVID. After the after the Zoom calls and the Skype, you then met and did the shoot. Yes, for the actual That's filming, right. we met in person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of well, see, those things are possible today. It's the world has changed. You were doing it before anybody was doing it, really. That's yeah, great. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but so I, I, I'm gonna, I'll send you a couple. Of, did you get my Zoom plays? I don't think I did, but I will. Definitely. I'll send. You, I made three Zoom plays for the Theater of the New City. Yeah. And uh, that's how, you know, we we never shot it. We just did Zoom the whole way. Now it's recorded, you know. 
Right. So not quite the same thing, but remind me, I'll, I'll send them to you, right? I'll watch them. Uh, yeah. If there's something you want, if there's any of them that you want me to share with the audience, I'll put them on the, the website. It's up to you. You can you... put them up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Put them up. Put them yeah. up. When I, when I met you, Barry, um, to give a little bit of the background, was uh, main media workshops and you were teaching uh, acting techniques for directors. Mm -hmm. And this is a class experience really that was a lot of fun for me, life changing. And I was always impressed by your energy level that you were, <laughs> you were, you were making us tired and there was however many students in any given session, but you were always kind of, you were, we had mosh pits. We were watching movies, James Franco playing um, James Dean in a movie. Uh, I remember, you know, and uh, you showed us Mistress, you showed us audition tapes. And I guess what I'm hoping, but I don't know this to be true, is that whether it's the main media workshops or, you know, North Carolina School of the Arts or wherever it might be for people, Los Angeles, where you are, that people have the opportunity to enjoy these type of rich acting, directing experiences. Wow. And I, I just don't know if some of the people that I work with have even have either sought those experiences or have come across them uh, organically? No, no. Well, um, Michael, uh, I, aren't you trying to teach down there? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I was just getting my feet wet here in Jacksonville. I was only here for about six months before COVID struck. So, um, I've done uh, a Caitlin's monologues with a lady from Chicago. I did an interview with her and helped her with a monologue, which is on the Mike Messi YouTube channel once again. But as far as leading a real life in person acting class, that hasn't happened yet here, but I'd like to do it. Have you tried to talk to the schools or tried to, uh, you know, have, do they have an acting school down there? Well, from what I understand, there's two, but I wouldn't vouch for either one of them. I mean, from what I've seen, they're kind of competing with each other. And it's like, uh, one's very, to, to be succinct, one's very uh, motivated by money and the other one is very self-important from what I gather. Yeah. So I would try to be somewhere uh, beyond either one of them if I were to do this on my own. And, and that's well, just you've based had on my probably own. as much, if not more experience than they have. So right. I, I would, you know, maybe you could start by just a few people in your house and let it build or whatever it is, you know. I'm open for it because where I'm living actually does have a backyard that would that has plenty of seats. Yeah. Well, you can't do anything about how is the pandemic in Jacksonville? Well, you know what? Um, there are I I I have places that I go that I feel comfortable. The movie theater here is open. You go in, you wear a mask, you go see a movie, you sit down, you can take your mask off. I was in the, the, I went to see the movie Scream tonight from 1996. They had it as a comeback classic. And the what, what what movie? Scream, the horror movie. Wes Craven, Scream. All oh, right, 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 right. And I, I, this is funny, Barry. I had a reserved seat. I sat in the back row of the theater. One other guy comes into the movie theater, and he has to sit right in front of me. So I mean, it's always the way, right? <laughs> you know, like we got this whole movie theater to ourselves, and he's got to sit many, right in front of me. Do they have in the movie? Do they have the seats all? separated well what they do is you use an app on your phone to reserve a seat and then once you reserve your seat they knock off two or three seats next to you all right okay so it's limited capacity but they let people bring hot dogs in and popcorn and all that shit yeah they're still selling all that stuff man they, too bad. they yeah be. they're still selling um they're still selling everything so it to me i'm i went to see rocky one through six i went to see back to the future uh, Liam Nielsen, I always say his name wrong. Liam. They're showing all these old movies? Yeah, they're showing a lot of movies. from. How, the, how much do they charge? Five bucks. That's, that's all right. It's okay. It's fun. I mean, I enjoy it. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay. But it's um, okay. Jacksonville still has a pulse. You know, like I, I had left New England and, uh, you know, from the reports I get from my family and my friends up there, New England's really been suffering uh, through this pandemic. Yeah, worse sure. than florida and um with time restrictions and and you can't go from massachusetts to rhode island and oh, um, really? yeah i mean that's that's come and gone a few times but um well, how just, do they stop you how do they stop you i have no idea i mean i think that if they see your license plate and oh. it's a different state then they give you a hard time mm -hmm. and uh i don't know what the penalties are or if it's a fine or warning or what but 
um i you know when i went up for that movie uh two weeks ago barry yeah. in pennsylvania i could feel the tension getting more intense as i drove north with each yeah. with each state you know going up four or five states you can feel it it's a tangible thing so it's tough how's it how's uh I want to get back to the acting in a minute, but but just how is Los Angeles treating you and where you're at with everything? I know you're you're teaching via uh, Zoom. You're teaching acting. Yeah, I'm, 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 no, I'm right now. I'm teaching. I'm teaching in Europe on the Zoom for the. I'm teaching at the academy, the film academy in in Lithuania. I teach there every year, but I couldn't go this year, so I'm doing it on Zoom. And it's an 18 day course and uh, we do it every morning and they, they, they work on it every night. I'm just starting on it Monday. So it's a big, big experiment. They're going to be in three different rooms and we're going to work, but you know, I guess we'll work it out somehow or another, you know, I'm doing that. And then um, I usually teach at LMU Loyola at Marymount. It's a good film school. And I teach there. I didn't do it last term. They didn't, they decided not to have it, but this time I think we're doing, I teach a course on uh, teaching actors, directors, how to work, how, how, actors how to work with directors. And I'm also teaching a course on Kazan again. I'd show his movies and talk about his acting techniques. I teach those two classes right now, you know, so that's what I'm doing, you know, and I'm also, you know, trying to make a movie. I had an actor and the actor left. Mm. So now I still believe it or not have the money, but we have to find the actor that will be acceptable to the people that have the money. You follow? Yes, you need you need someone who's got the name value. That's that, right. Right, and that's that's an aspect of filmmaking that sometimes very people outside the business don't understand. The term you used to use was civilians, <laughs> which I always got a kick out of <laughs> the uh, the people outside the film industry. But well, you know. It's <laughs> it's like any business they want to guarantee that their money can come back you know and and in their mind they want those few people who have name value and now i'm doing another movie i think i told you from something i wrote and and the director and i uh are going ahead with making this movie and that movie is going to have very wonderful actors in it and maybe one actor with a name and we still are doing it anyway and, and it's just that at that level of filmmaking and the script is very good and the actors are good at that level of filmmaking, if the movie is made for as little money as we're making it for, I think there's no way that anybody who invests in it won't get their money back. There's just so many venues that it could be sold in. You know? Was that the one that, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that the one that, that was kind of based on your experiences at the film workshops in Maine? No, that one I'm still trying to make. Okay. That, it's interesting you brought that up though. That I'm still trying to make, so long. But no, this is something that came out of a short that I wrote uh, about, about an older gangster and his family and who is trying to save his family from getting into the life because he regrets his life and what, what it did to his family. And now what he wants to do is get them to stop romanticizing his life and to, and to go straight. And he has a time limit because he has cancer. And so it's constantly about, uh, uh, you know, trying to find a way to right the wrongs that he fe feels that he created, you know, and he goes a long distance and it's an interesting movie. It's, it's, um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's done by a director who's, who I like this, his movie, he made a movie called the maestro and he was a very good director. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, so, so, so that's what we're doing. So it doesn't have a lot of names in it, but it has a very good story. We are going to try to get one name only and pay him a certain amount to work one day. 
just so we have that on the video box. Right. But beyond all that, this movie could work if it's done very well as a kind of sleeper. It's a kind of sleeper, yeah. And hello, can't hear you. Do you want to mention any of the names of these films, Barry? Well, uh, that's um, up to you. It's, a, it's a, I just don't yeah, know. No, the, help film, the film, the film, the film, this film is called The Five Families, the one okay. we're talking about. Okay. That, my, my film, you know, it's called 20% Fiction. That's Remember right. That? I do. Yeah. That's the film I've been trying to find an actor for. I had a very good actor, but he, he and I, uh, he, 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 he wanted to change the script in a way that, that it just couldn't work. And it was so heartbreaking because we had the money to pay him. But wow. nevertheless, it just didn't work. And these people are willing to go with another actor, but that actor also has to be of equal, you know, equal. Name value, name recognition. Well, yeah, sure. I don't know if, I mean, the guy that I just had a few scenes with, I don't know if he would work or not, but just as an aside, we talked about him off air, Peter Green, the guy that played Zed in Pulp Fiction. I thought no, he was he's very great. Good. He's a very good actor. Yeah, I don't know if he would work for this part project, but he was intense and uh, he was, I mean, I just felt the energy from this guy as soon as he came into the room that this guy feels like he's on the tightrope at all actor. times. Yeah. He's a good actor, he's a good actor and he's somebody to think about, maybe, Maybe that's somebody to um, to uh, think about for our movie, Five Families, because there is one role that they're thinking of of uh, using a star in. Now he's not really a name, uh, not big name value, but he's a nice, he's a good. I hate to talk that way. He's a good name. He's you know the whole movie is a package. You know who uh, who David Proval is? He was in Mean Streets. Oh yeah. And, Bob played the bartender in Main Streets. Um, right. Scorsese's and, first movie, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, no, it's his, not his first, his first. I was in... Boxcar Bertha was his Boxcar, first with you. Was, I think, well, that's his first Hollywood movie. He had done right. a movie in school first. Right. You know, so, you, know, you and Boxcar. Barbara Hershey. That's Barbara. right. Yeah, well, what right. was that like, Barry? If we could jump back in the time machine a little bit and then jump it around. Are we? You can't see me now, can you? I can still see you, buddy. I don't know why I can't see anything. Well, you, there was someone in the back who was adjusting your lights. We caught a glimpse of someone in the background who adjusted your lights for a minute. I don't know why they did. They put the light on. Yeah, it was a female. I, so. done that. I gotta get. How do I get? How do I get back on to see you? Okay, push the uh, camera button. There's a little camera icon at the bottom of the screen. It's a little, uh, or a view. Oh yeah, I don't see it. Where is it? Camera, I'm not working. Camera, I'm not working. Yeah, I can still see you and I'm still seeing myself. So how do I get camera? Uh, if you take your mouse, if you're using a mouse, go to the bottom of the screen where all those, it says security, participants, chat, uh, on the no. far left, maybe at the bottom of the screen, it says video, something like that. No, it doesn't Or view. That. Do you see a little grid that says the word view, Barry? Do you see that? Down there? Well, it could be on the upper right. Upper right, upper right. It says the word view would probably pop in. View. Yeah. Upper view. right, upper right. Yeah, upper right of whatever screen you're looking at. Look for the word view. With a grid. I don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. No, no, no. I, don't I can see, see it. We're still recording. I can see you fine, and I can see myself fine. Well, don't so, worry about it. Then we'll just we'll just go on talking. Don't worry. About yeah, you can. I'm not much to look at tonight anyway. I'm wearing my ACDC shirt, and uh, you know. Um, but I wanted to talk about your experience with Boxcar Bertha because I think that. That must have been a great experience for you. Barbara Hershey, I mean, she was at the top of her game and she looked great and she was a great uh, young actress at the time. And what do you remember about that experience? Well, you know, everything. I mean, it's, it's a, a very nice experience. Very nice experience because um, 
Well, it was fun. You know, we were down in Camden, Arkansas, and we were young, and Marty was young, and he was talented, and David Carradine and I and Barbara would get in the room, and we were there working on the script intensely for about a week and really pulling it together. And um, we had a wonderful time, and I love working with Marty. It was fun. You know, we, we it was, um, uh, you could see that Marty was a very special, you know, had a special energy to him. And I love the character. You know, I played a guy not different than Marty who would come from New York down south and didn't know what the hell he was going on. He didn't know anything about guns. He, he was joined a gang. Right. And he was kind of a coward. So it was fun. And Marty always described it as um, the Wizard of Oz that I, I was the cowardly lion, you know? And uh, we, we all had a great time. We, we bonded together in that little town. There wasn't much to do but count the parking meters. It's just right. a couple of blocks of parking meters. And I, I like being in the uh, South. I like the South in general, it's so exotic. Yeah. And all the locations were very interesting. All of them, all of them were very interesting. As a matter of fact, we shot in that kind of a a jail right in town, which was horrible, you know, old fashioned, really horrible jail, but we shot in it. It was interesting. And, um, you know, we, it was, you felt that Marty was special, you know, we, we, um, there's just certain intensity and certain intensity. You, you knew that Marty was going to be something special. And you knew, you know, the movie was a B movie. We made it in you know, what, 21 days or something for Roger Corman. And it was reviewed in the New York Times as being a very special movie. They noticed that it was um, not just a B film, but that had, you know, it had all of Marty's themes in it, the crucifixion at the end. And uh, do you remember the movie? No? Yeah, I remember watching it at some point in, in between the summers that I was going up to Maine yeah, and seeing yeah. you. So I remember. It, but that all of Marty, Marty's major themes in it. Right. And, uh, and uh, this, you know, I think it was the fun of filmmaking. We were, we were flying at the, with the seat of our pants. Right. But with a very good general in command. And that's a wonderful feeling when you have, you know, somebody who you trust is, is leading you a certain direction, but giving you a lot of freedom. There was a lot of freedom within the movie. And uh, I always feel better when I'm involved in, 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 in the actual writing of it, in the actual shaping of the character. And Marty certainly allowed that with all of us, us to have, you know, he used everybody for, for who they were in a lot of ways, you know, so it was, Oh God! Somebody scared me. Sorry. And and um, this is my wife Julie. Julie. Yeah. You changed the lighting in here by putting on that light. Shut that light. Shut it. Shut it. You shut. You turn the light on in here. And that's better. Oh. Oh, okay. Isn't that better, Michael? Yeah, that's good, buddy. Thank you. Hi, I, Julie. I, no, don't. Oh, okay. It's fine. Can you see me well, right? I, I can see you fine, buddy. Yeah, I can see you. It seems like you got a table full of scripts, which I would imagine you would. Yes, I have a lot of that. Stuff. <laughs> table full of scripts. Table full of scripts waiting to be, be the done. title of your memoir, right? Or, yes. Or, yeah, <laughs> table, yeah, yeah, yeah. table full of scripts. Some of them are the same. Some of them are my own scripts. So there's many versions of them, you know. Oh yeah, I know what that's like. Yeah. You know that that business when you write a script, you don't write it once. You write draft after draft. They say it isn't writing; it's it's rewriting, right? So. Yeah, I, I have one one of my screenplays. I have my my master 105 page version, which I think will never get made, and then I have my 80 page version, which maybe has a shot. So I know what you mean, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've been cutting pages from one of my scripts, you know, too. And after a while, you know, they. It's funny you remember that script about. About the, uh, it's it's almost embarrassing how long it's been to make that movie. Twenty percent fiction. Oh yeah, it's just, it takes it takes for. Uh, it takes a, a long, long time, you know. So.
it's a tough business and then, and that's one thing that i think people yeah. maybe they understand at some level but they don't understand unless they've tried how tough it can be how frustrating it can be and of course why would someone do it the payoff the creative payoff or the financial payoff or the the, the experiences that you that you have that you can think about and enjoy that's why people do this stuff right well yeah i mean yeah i mean yeah sure i mean uh, it's you know with me i think that 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 particular movie for instance is changed as i've changed it's like a diary almost you know and changing as my life changes um you know i've been doing it so long since i'm a kid that i i mean acting or directing or teaching with all of it that um it's been a life you know it's just the whole life it's 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 just i don't you know I don't know. Just that's what it is. You know, that that's what it is. You know, it's, you know, Shakespeare, all of Shakespeare's writing is about the theater. Right. You know, we are such, you know, I mean, um, the seven acts of, 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 of man and, you know, um, life's but a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more so everything he relates to in terms of the theater because he was a theater man you know and i guess i i uh that's become part of my psyche you know i do i hear you and uh, well you have that too now you, you, you know you have that too you know yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, Barry, how things have uh, changed, but they haven't, you know, and, and even in this pandemic time, which I'm hoping is over relatively soon, it might be a year or it might be more, who knows, but eventually it will be over. Um, but I think about the fact that in, for instance, even in my area, live theater pretty much is at a halt right now. Right. But like you said, uh, you have these Zoom plays. Oh, yeah. I'm on the email list of a lot of, of theaters because I, um, I enter my stage scripts into uh, plays, uh, play playhouses across the world. Uh, yeah. Typically, a little bit of a plug here, but typically I use Play Submissions Helper, which is a website right. Right. that I'm that I'm involved with in uh, business wise right. a little bit. Right. And um, when I enter my plays to these festivals, you don't know for it might take six months or even nine months or ten months if you if your play got accepted or not. But no. What has what's been happening though is that on their email emails from most of these theaters, they found a way to still do stuff, and, and a lot of them are uh, Skype or Zoom or virtual, you know, whatever it is, Facebook Live. That they're doing productions similar to yourself in a way that they're doing something creatively using the technology uh, while we wait this thing out, for lack of a better sure. term. So that's still impressive to me. It's to me, it's not quite the same, but at least there's you can't keep the human spirit down or you can't keep people's need for communication through the creative process uh, uh, dead uh, for too long. It's going to it's going to have to happen. They're going to have to express themselves and people want to hear what they have to say, which is good news. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of political plays out there right now, a lot of political zooming, you know, a lot of plays that are about, you know, the situation in America right now, you know, sure. a lot of that, you know, and, yeah. but that's probably very healthy, you know, that the content's going to change when this is lifted. I think the play movies will, will probably be more social conscious for a while, at least. And uh, I don't think things will return ever to quite the way they were. And that will be maybe for a, a, a good, for the good in some ways, you know, you know. Do you, in that regard, do you mean with the live audience experience or do you mean? Well, I the... think even movies, I don't think people are going to make, I don't think movie theaters will be the same. 
uh, I think there'll be a few theaters and those theaters will be for big movies or maybe special movies. But I, I don't think, I think, I think unfortunately or whatever, the, uh, the movie experience is gonna be rare now. It's gonna be, people have gotten used to Zooming, you know? Or, or, uh, or Netflix and Netflix, Hulu, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the thing is very, I've, I, when, even the last three or four or five months here in Florida, they've opened up movie theaters and I, I've been going and I've, I've noticed that there's not huge crowds, but there's some crowds, you know. Uh, okay. That's going to be, but I don't know whether movie theaters can compete with, uh, with, with Netflix and stuff. I don't know if they can, you know. Well, I, I hope they can. I mean, I know sometimes the theaters do special events where they'll have the opera. They'll have a live broadcast of the Met Opera in the theater. They might have a boxing match or a UFC match. So they've been kind of sprinkling in these special events for at least 15 years. Well, and, and movies have now drive-ins. I think Florida has a lot of drive-ins, doesn't it? I think it does, yeah. I haven't been myself, but I think you're right. There's several in Florida. But, you know, where did, where did you see The Irishman? Home, uh, on a television? Or, or Yeah, I saw the Netflix, yep. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Movie that cost $200 million and only showed in the theaters for four weeks, you know? Right. That's, you know, so, you know, uh, you know. I, I saw the movie because I was in it and, and I went I was invited but but I didn't I didn't uh, you know most people saw that on on uh, on Zoom I mean yeah. on, on on television you know on on their screens you know? so even a movie like and, and you know Marty makes movies that should be seen in the theaters they're so beautiful but that, that's the only people that would finance it you know right. Hey, Barry, I want to, we, we, it's funny because we talk about so many things and sometimes I think we might have, we, we had the initial idea to talk about the acting process, which we've kind of strayed away from, and that's fine. Maybe we'll do a part three where we really dig deep, but okay. if, if you were going to give, you know, a five minute or a three minute, this is how you get started, kid, you know, maybe just someone who's never acted before. If oh, you they get started, started acting? Yeah, or, or what books to read or what videos oh, to watch or something to get them, something they can chew on just to go from point zero to point one. No, well, there's some wonderful books. Uh, there's somebody who is my teacher, Uta Hagen, H-A-G-A-N, Uta, U-T-A. She wrote a book called Respect for Acting that you read, Michael. You know? Most definitely. And there's uh, wonderful books by a great teacher by the name of Sandy Meisner. Yep. And um, and then there's a book by Lee Strasberg called um, A Dream of Passion. Another good book. But, you know, books are are okay and they're, and they're good to wait one, one's appetite but um if you can find a, a a place to to uh work to, to do scenes and to to act if you can find a teacher that you that um that that likes to teach acting and and, and this you know really understands it That'd be the best thing to do. But today, of course, people are foregoing all of that and they're making little movies and learning how to act in movies. They're, they're making their little own movies. Which sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, there's, there's a whole, you know, culture of YouTube stuff. And, uh, no. you know, but I mean, I think you're, I wasn't gonna. I, I, I'll say this because I don't think you 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 weren't you weren't gonna say it. But I mean, sometimes if people put stuff on YouTube, but they have, it, it can be fun. It can be glib. It can be exciting. But is there content there that's gonna stand the test of time beyond a, a couple of chuckles? And uh, 
that remains to be seen. It depends on the project, but I think one thing that I've experienced, Barry, is that when people take the craft a little bit more seriously, when they take some classes, when they read some books, it shows in the work. And it's just like anything else. Uh, you put the time in, you get the results. If you don't, you don't. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, that's a good point. Now, I don't know who, who we're talking to, but for instance, you know, the only... I'm very limited in my knowledge of, of, of teachers outside of Los Angeles and, and New York. And yet I know, for instance, in Florida, there are some good schools in Sarasota and I think University of Miami and maybe Jacksonville that have good departments. And maybe in each of these city, there's some wonderful acting teacher that I don't know of. I would explore around where I live first to see if there there are, and then if you're, if you're, you know, and then I don't know, and then I think I would really find that out some way or another way by going online or whatever it is. Most actors in my time when they came from cities like Florida. For instance, I knew Faye Dunaway when she came up from Florida and became a big star. Yep. She, went to, she went to the University of Boston. She mm. was from Florida. Nice. And, and uh, when Faye came up and, and most actors I knew did what she did. They, they left wherever they were and they went to wherever the center of, of acting was, wherever that was. She went to University of Boston, but then she went to New York. And in my day, everybody from Marlon Brando to James Dean to whatever, they fled to New York from wherever they were, because that's where the good teachers were. But today you have maybe classes on Zoom, or uh, I don't know if everybody has to go. Los Angeles has some good teachers. I don't know if everybody has to go anymore to, to New York and Los Angeles, but it depends how strong your, uh, your desire is. I, I don't know how you can make a career except in a few cities like that, you know? I don't know. I don't know yeah. how they do it. I was lucky I came from New York, you know? Right. So I was lucky. You know? I, um, it's, it's everything. It's funny, I was gonna say, this makes no sense, but I'll say it, everything changes, but everything stays the same. I mean, I think in the <laughs> the film and entertainment world and, and acting on stage, it's it's still New York and LA are still the hubs of activity and people sure. with the money to get the bigger projects made. I, th I think, you know, speaking for myself personally, I guess I enjoy being in control of a project. And uh, I found that for, from circumstance or whatever, being in the smaller markets for now is good for me, but maybe that'll change but, in the future. Who knows? No, but there's all this all regional filmmaking. You know, there's certain places that are strong about it. Right. I think, um, I don't know, uh, Seattle was, uh, and uh, Boston, I think, has some. Um, New Orleans, maybe. Oh, Atlanta. There are places that are strong in regional filmmaking, you know? So I made a wonderful movie. I think one of my, maybe my best movie, the best movie that I enjoyed most, Heartland, which was made in the middle of, of, middle of Montana. Really regional uh, f filmmaking, you know? Nice. So, you know, everyone's got to find their own, um, their own uh, thing but for an actor to make a living outside of those major theater centers i don't know i don't know how you do it i just don't know how even there it's extremely hard you know so it's not an easy thing to do you have to overwhelmingly want it you know don't do it unless you want to i always say you know unless you have to how's that I don't you're know. driven you're driven to it, driven to do it. That makes well sense. michael we, can we have a part three
Yeah, I think most definitely. I know that you just got back from New York. You were telling me. I am, I am, I am. Unless you have some burning question. I don't know if I've been helpful or anything. Well, I think you have been. I think we'll leave, like, like I like to say sometimes, leave something for the next time. So we'll leave something for the next time. But uh, Barry, this has been another great interview. Well, you've been, you, you know, you're always inspiring because you have a lot of tenacity. And I wish you all, Michael, all of all the best, you know, and and hope you have a lot of success. And I appreciate what you're doing. I hope you'll get a class together down there. Well, I think uh, that'd be great, you know, and so people can contact me through MikeMessier.com. They can look up Barry Primus. Barry, uh, if people were to want to reach out to you, is there a way that they can do that? Should they go to your IMDb Pro page? What, what do you suggest if people are interested in Barry Primus? Are they interested in Barry Primus? Where would I tell them to look? Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't think. Do I, I don't think I have a web page at the moment. Uh, I have all kinds of things on the. Um, they can write to me on Facebook. I'm on there, and they can write to me on Google. I'll answer them. You know. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All and right. if if anyone has a hard time reaching Barry, you can. Send a message through MikeMessier.com and I'll forward it to him. I'll, I'll be your filter. How about that? <laughs> okay, great. And, you know, I'll send you these Zoom plays. And then if people are interested, you can advertise them or whatever. Okay. I will do that. I'll put them on the website. Well, Barry, thank you so much for being here with us again. And I, I, look, appreciate I look forward it. to seeing you one of these days. Most definitely. Thank you very much, sir. And have a great night and a great stay, week. Stay strong, Mike. Thanks, Barry. You too, buddy. Thank you. This is Mike Messier wrapping up with Barry Primus. Thanks, everyone, for watching us. Uh, more celebrity interviews here on the Mike Messier YouTube channel. We've got the part one hey, with Barry are. Primus. <laughs> See, I finally got you with the last, the last, the last moment of it all. Yep. Yeah. We got Michael McGlone. We got uh, Randy Couture, the natural, Barry's friend, and all types of stuff. Thanks for watching uh, Mike Messier YouTube channel, MikeMessier.com. Hey, safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Bye, buddy. Thanks a lot.